this session is about just having an exchange. We'd love to hear your comments on the guides, the manual, the directions we're taking things. Let's expand on the last conversation on focus areas of growth for how Requirement Working Group can help in COSI and its practices. We may decide to spin off topics for special presentations. We like to have those about every month. So this is more of a free exchange. I am not going to do all the talking. I just wanted to set up the introduction. If you guys want to keep talking about what we were previously about um, some of the guides and our content and give us feedback as well, that's a free for all. Just be uh, courteous of each, each other. I know Zoom can be challenging with the speaking and the muting and all that. So use chat if you want to as well, and we'll do our best to have a good conversation. Does anyone want to kick off or continue discussions of what would, we were just talking about? I would put something on the table. We can talk about this later. Has anybody given consideration when it comes to requirements to the implementation of the the automotive functional safety standard ISO 262662 deals a lot with requirements and deals a lot with MDSE. It's kind of like its own kind of systems engineering standard to itself. It's interesting from a domain specific standpoint, like the petroleum industry, they have their APIs. Food and Drug Administration has their way of doing needs and requirements and product development. The FAA has its guidelines. And so there's so many different industry specific things put out, it's hard to address all those in an overall framework document. And I look at the manual as being an overall framework. I don't expect anyone to really follow everything in the manual as it's written. And so each of the groups would tailor what's in the manual to meet their needs. And really, the manual is about gathering the knowledge you need to be successful and analyzing, maturing that knowledge, and then how you communicate that knowledge to different stakeholders across the life cycle. So automotive um, has that standard. I don't know how we would address it specifically, just recognize that there's going to be the different domain implementations of system engineering. From another side, working day to day with um, safety engineers, these are typically different persons from the one that uh, elicit requirements and they have different environments, different interfaces. But the important thing from my advice viewpoint is are the commonalities among the standard needs or the needs which are not safety related or directly safety related and the needs which are specific for safety. So addressing these commonalities could be useful, really. I like your talk about the commonality part because in my line of business, what I do in consulting, I'm exposed to all industries and I've worked in automobile, base, medical device, software centric. So that's how I kind of view product development is what's in common between the different domains. And I find that in reality, even though they use a different language to describe things, that the fundamental underpinning are the same across all domains. It's just how they address those in specific processes. That's absolutely right. I think that's an important point. The foundations are the same, and these documents should speak to not that everything applies to everyone, but that here's the fundamentals and how it works. And then I thought that there was, was talk of having supplemental guides that could focus on more specific information. So, for example, I was looking at a guide for writing requirements, a guide for requirements engineering in an agile environment, a guide for requirements engineering for system security, those kind of things. But in terms of different domains, when I was a manager, was trying to find ways to get my system engineers to interact with requirements in different domains, because if they applied all the processes and the practices in uh, satellite communications, and then I brought them over and they did it again in radar, there was a lot of aha moments as they generalized across two different domains. Where you always have to tailor. I've tried to take generalizing things from Nkosi, and when I'm writing processes or helping develop processes where I work, everything is tailored to our specific needs. And you're right, even within our own segment or division, there's still need for further tailoring. So you have to be open to that. But Remember the fundamental. Fundamentals are really are, are what going to drive doing a job the most efficient way possible. And so if you keep the fundamentals in the back of your head, it's fairly easy to tailor things. And you have to do an analysis on a return on investment. So sometimes you can't always quantify it, but you have to look at it sometimes subjectively. But I totally agree with you, Beth. It's important to 
Mm, one of the important outputs uh, or feedback from the use of the guidelines could be that persons from different departments or with different viewpoints come to recognize what is uh, relevant and so tailoring for them and recognize that these aspects are really, once again, common to other aspects. Typically, safety persons pers think that their work is more important than the other ones because we work on safety, safety first. Okay? Uh, but then, eliciting needs uh, regarding safety is not so different from eliciting needs regarding uh, performance uh, of a system or of a product. That is not that there are a lot of once again uh, a lot of overlapping and same cost. So putting the uh, once again the persons in the middle, the person should recognize what are really the foundations of their work on the how to, not on the theory. Yeah. Eduardo made an interesting comment in the, the chat about our the additions that I suggested really guides, and maybe that's where this breaks down. I had a meeting just before the workshop started on some things that were developing at WPI, and I didn't have this document in front of me, the, the graphic, and so I was just doing it off the top of my head, and I said, oh, oh, wait, wait, do you see what's coming out of the requirements working group? They have this requirements engineering manual, and then... Under that is going to be this guide to soliciting needs and then writing requirements and managing the requirements and verifying requirements and validating needs. And it's really well organized. And then we'll have this opportunity for, and how do you apply this in agile? How do you apply this in security? How do you apply this in safety? How do you apply this in, in all these other things? And I'll be able to use these for my modules. I'm going to redo my requirements class. And so I, I got them all excited and I hope they don't quote any of the names I use because that none of them matched what I what I saw on the paper when I looked at it uh, after the meeting. I want to thank you, Beth, for being a great advocate for the work that we're trying to do here and spreading the great word. We're really trying to make other people's lives better, or enabled. And so thank you for, for sharing all that. Yeah, it's exciting to hear that, you know, there's people that want to use this thing or can't wait to get their hands on it. Well, it's for that reason that we're not going to polish these pristinely before putting them out. I think Rick, you even noted in the chat, we've got to get something out. We've got to let people mm -hmm use it. Now, I love the idea of, well, can we make this data-driven, virtual, CBOC-like? Maybe the publishing with tech ops can go a couple of different ways. Maybe our idea of thinking of these as documents could be a little outdated, but then we also need as, as Beth noted, a way for her to bring teachable material into happening as well. So we'll look at and discuss different options. I will tell you, we're working on training as well. If JD's still on the line here, he even reached out to help us. We're going to update all of our training material. This is the idea of we could do what's more modern, sound bites of training instead of big, long, hours-long classes. You know, there's different ways we can do video presentations. So we're going to be looking a little more out of the box on how to update that as well as when we get this products published. I got training in online learning which is different than online teaching. So online teaching, which is what a lot of people are doing because of the pandemic, is where you take a face-to-face -face classroom and then you instantiate a poor imitation of that face-to-face -face classroom on Zoom. Online learning is where you look at how a, a student who is doing something asynchronous and online is absorbing the material. So that means none of my lectures are longer than 10 minutes. If I assign reading, I don't lecture on the reading. I provide a lecture that gives context so that the reading has some stickiness, but I assign the reading. And you either read it or you do a lecture. You don't do both because otherwise you're saying, here's your reading assignment, but I don't trust you to read it, so I'm going to tell it to you too. So I assign reading, and then I have an open book reading quiz that has the students interact with the reading. And I tell the students they can open the quiz and do the reading, and then and when they see a quiz question, they go, oh, this must be important to Dr. Beth. Okay, well, I'll pay attention to that. They could do the quiz as they're doing the reading, or they could do the reading and then do the quiz to see if they, they got what they needed out of it. And then I may have lecture that is bringing different concepts together, and then I'll have an exercise that applies the concepts. But all of, all of these are little chunks. I did a 45 minute lecture before I went to the training. The instructional designers showed me how much I was torturing the students. 
I uh, honestly, as a current student, completely appreciate the approaches you've been, you've been doing and talking about. I too have been doing online learning and I also have been investigating various online learning you can get at YouTube. I don't know how many of your students decide that YouTube is a good platform to learn from as well. But there are five minute videos out there on YouTube that teach you a concept. You name the concept. And right. the best, most memorable ones, they're visual, they're mm -hmm. succinct, they're interesting, and they're short. <laughs> And so one of the things we're looking at is perhaps using that as a mechanism to relay some of the concepts we're doing. And so JD offered to help me with some ideas. And I think we're going to use you as a sounding board when we start putting the, some of this together. I think that would be nice to get your perspective. That'd be good. And I know there's YouTube videos out there because I get the surveys at the end of the class from the students. And when I know I've done a good job is when the student says, I didn't have to YouTube any of the content. So they got everything they needed from my lectures and they didn't have to go to YouTube to figure out what I was talking about. I think that's awesome. I also am a parent of two college students who are also sharing this with me. So it's really, really awesome. I'm getting yeah. some great ideas yeah. in the chat here as well. People have been really good about sharing thoughts and the idea of going virtual with our material. There's some merit there and some folks are really recognizing we're in a different world. And even our manual talks about going less document centric. And we're talking about making our material point to each other. And how can you do that if everything's on the Table. Several years ago, I talked to tech ops when I told them about the concept of having multiple documents. And they said that they can support a platform where we put the electronic versions of the documents there so we can maintain the structure, but we can hyperlink stuff back and forth. And so everything could be very tightly integrated through the hyperlinks. And then the person, in, when they're going through, if they want to see a definition of a word, they could right click on that word. If, if there's a certain concept is mentioned, there could be a link where that concept is discussed in detail, and then they can return back to the text they're reading. So there's all kinds of ways that we could put this in an interactive method. I know Apple came out with a way of creating electronic textbooks that were really based heavily on being able to hyperlink different knowledge areas together, but yet provided some sort of structure. The problem with Wikipedias and stuff is there's not as much structure in the overall sense. So we could maintain structure, but still have the hyperlink capability online. And Kelsey can provide that platform for us. So one thing I do want to caution is, um, as an instructor, I developed the class. I use CBOC as well in the class. But one of the things I do is I point them to CBOC, but I also provide a PDF of what CBOC look like when I wrote the quiz. So if it's going to be dynamic, it's a little bit troublesome for, for configuration management in a college course. And I also want to return to accessibility. We have enough challenges in making a document accessible. That means using the headers, not using color to distinguish between what is important, what isn't, um, having alt text for all graphics, you know, make it so that a reader can read it. Our SE handbook is not vision accessible. And we had to go to Wiley and get a, uh, an accessible version because the, the columns are too close together and the reader just goes right across the blank space. So the handbook makes no sense to somebody who has, has low vision. And if we have YouTube videos, YouTube has captioning. It's an ASR tool. It's underwhelming as a person with hearing loss, what, what comes up on the captioning for technical content. I once had an ASR tool give me text for a product line engineering lecture, and it sounded like it was a religious lecture. It completely changed the domain of the, the content. And so on a web-based, it also there's other things. That I don't know as much about uh, web access, accessibility issues. And Nkosi has a YouTube channel. It's a good point. We should probably start looking at that. Some of the videos I've been seeing that I really resonate with actually did have narration, audio, and visual. So one of the things that I think resonate with me as a visual learner is I like to see the words on the screen, even though I can hear fine, it doesn't process the same. So I do like the aspect of not relying on the YouTube captioning, but perhaps infusing our concepts both visually and with an audio perspective. What I probably do is send you one of my favorite videos on requirements engineering that I got from a MATLAB channel. It's five <laughs> minutes and it was right on point with a lot of the concepts. And I was like, wow, I want this guy to work for a requirement working group and help us with our products too. And I think JD knows him, but it did. It had, it had what you said. And I think the accessibility aspect is a really good takeaway. When you think about the user community and the user needs, there is a whole bunch of folks out there who work different industries, different mm -hmm. countries, different languages, 
different abilities. And so mm -hmm. we definitely can't always accommodate everybody at first pass, but it's also potentially a goal to evolve our products in that direction as well. I led an accessibility task force a year and a half ago, and we presented that work to the, the board at last year's IW. And so the technical products procedures have now been updated for the accessibility requirements. They've probably changed after you had submitted your proposals. And on the, the narrative, when I started doing lectures, as somebody with a hearing loss, I felt that I just couldn't in good conscience produce a video lecture that just showed the slides and had no words. So I generated a script. And so I have a companion narrative. I call it a companion narrative because I don't read it exactly. So it's not a transcript, but it's all the words that I was trying to say in the lecture. So I give the students the PowerPoint, the video, and the narrative. And the narratives are a huge hit because if they say, oh, I think she talked about this in that lecture, they don't have to listen to the lecture again. They could just search in the, the documents, in the narratives. No, but that's exactly what I do when I do training for our, our segment. Um, I script out every slide mm -hmm. and I read read it, right? And I may embellish here or there, but I do it modularly. I do one slide at a time, then I combine them all. And then I send it to a post-processing department that puts it on a scoring format so it can get onto the learning management system. But I like scripting it out. It makes me articulate it better. It makes me think about it more. I'm speaking my point across. It makes it keep it shorter. Mm -hmm. And then if somebody doesn't understand what I said, they can always go back and pull the slides and in the notes section of the slides, they'll have the narrative. Yeah. And the scripting, you're right. It makes it shorter. Because as I'm writing the script that goes with the slides, I can tell by how many pages I'll go, okay, it's too long. If it goes past that, I know I've exceeded my time limit. And then I look at my script and I realize, well, you know, that was therapeutic to tell them, but they don't need to know that. And that was fascinating, but irrelevant. So I can take that out. And so it does make the lectures more efficient. Definitely when I did one class face-to-face -face, and the week that we couldn't meet face-to-face, -face, I gave them all the, the scripted lectures and they asked if they were missing content because it was so much shorter. I said, no, you got the advantage of the well, script instead the of me. The things to write are the most concise things. Right. They take a lot of time and it's worth it. it. saves people a lot of time. I saw your note there, Tammy, about the working group. I'm triple booked on that Friday. So Friday is exactly like IW now. Now you know why we're early. Yeah. I recognize how many presentations are going Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I decided to just get off that path right away. So I also can attend some of those. But yes, I think that myself going to the training working group and a few others, we can get some concepts also as good and cozy recommended practices as well. But yes, I think that would help us. I also know there's a lot of resources now available to us that may not have existed a few years ago from the Encozy community, including a budget. From a business model, I think having a YouTube channel will help sell memberships or publish documents from Wiley. That might be a revenue stream and it might be something worthwhile for which we can contribute. Well, and, I, and there's also the, the professional development portal. And I think the training working group is working with that group. Well, I plan on attending uh, training working. I'm a member of that. Group. I just wrote to them and said that I won't be able to attend, but I went into my profile and joined, so I'll get their, their emails. We just had a chat from um, Alexandra. Would you like to say what you're thinking about? You would like to hear inputs on what? Oh, thank you very much. We're working on research and better understanding understanding the information technology and the operational technology workforce and how their perspectives come into uh, solutions. Uh, when we're engineering the solutions, we find that the control system community, uh, the industrial control system community approaches things somewhat differently than IT. And given that we are coming to this intersection between the two into the cyber physical workforce, we're really reaching out to get data collection about those two communities and insights that you might have on how we might um, approach that analysis and how that information might better inform us as we're looking at what would be some training paths would be tremendously useful. We're working in the DOD. We had a report to our administration on that cyber physical and control system workforce and are working on identifying with the suspense date of April 21 of what those workforce paths are. It would be very useful to hear your input and the training input. And sorry, I'm new to this community on how to interact through these working groups, but really would value insights on how we're shaping those questions. We have a survey it's actually a pretty deep survey, 203 questions. So it's pretty broad, but have almost 140 respondents so far and are kind of teasing out some information and data points that would help us actually scientifically say, 
this is a canvas of the workforce. We're trying to engineer solutions for this space, but really understanding the workforce that will be our operators. How would you like to share some of those questionnaires? What works for you in a virtual world right now? Oh, thank you very much for asking. We have a working session on Friday in this IW 2021. So really grateful for that. We do have a questionnaire that is open and available. If it's okay, then I can share a poster. I'm doing this as part of PhD dissertation research. So the Institutional Review Board Oversight is Colorado State University. We have our protocol number. All of the research data is intended to share out with our community to really support bringing the body of knowledge more data points. So I'm happy to share that with everyone. Finishing my PhD there as well. I thought your name sounded familiar. Uh, yeah, I should be done hopefully in another couple of months. Absolutely. You can put something in the chat if you'd like to send a link to some folks. This is a community that we're all trained to achieve some similar things. And so if we can help you, we're happy to. And then likewise, your contributions to our discussions on requirements and needs is valued as well. So we, we do appreciate that. Well, thank you. We do very much want to share the data from the survey out to everyone. I did put in for the next INCOSE symposium. I think we'll be ready to be able to share some of the data points from that. But I think some of the questions that were coming up or part of the discussion is somewhat interesting when we start asking, for example, about risk assessments or who's responsible for risk. Very quickly, we are starting to tease out and see that individuals who have responsibility for engineering solutions, designing solutions, when we ask the question of whether or not there is accountability or responsibility, or if they have any input to what risk is assessed, accepted, the response right now is a very large no. So I think that's starting to provide some of the things that came up in these discussions where we're responsible for designing systems, we're responsible for building these systems. And then when we start looking at things such as risk, what risk is accepted, or what tolerance or when risk is reviewed, then as part of the governance so far, the feedback from the questionnaire is that there's not involvement by those that are responsible for building. So I think some of these things will start to inform how we look at training. The response in conversation tends to be we need to better train individuals, but then when we look at real data points, we're finding out that some of the work performers have training, but they're not in the governance process given the ability to influence risk acceptance. So I think these data points, I'd absolutely like input on how we look at it looking at the data points and share out to the INCOSI community. Risk is really everybody's responsibility. Mm -hmm. There's a manager who assigns the responsible individuals, how to come up with mitigation strategies, which should be funded through the program, and then contingency plans, which you put into management reserve as an expected value. There's technical, there's programmatic, and there's different types of technical risk. You need to make people that are doing the estimates of the work responsible for digging out the minute risks and how they're going to mitigate them and what happens if they don't mitigate them. You can't just say it's an engineering thing or it's a program management thing or it's a project engineering thing. Everybody has to take ownership of risk because overrunning your budget is not fun at all when you have to report up to your senior manager. I think risk takes a different connotation in the cyber physical systems requirements that we're looking at right here because when you look at the NIST guides and the DOD guides, they refer to the risk management framework. The concept of making a risk-based decision on how to implement cybersecurity and cyber resiliency in the systems by taking a risk-based approach just meant that we weren't doing what I used to refer to as verification by exhaustion, where we opened the controls closet, took everything out, and we had a certifying agent come in and say, yep, you have access to you know, AC-17 and FC-743, and, and they checked everything off, and you had all the controls, and the system still wasn't secure. So I like that it got us thinking about cybersecurity and cyber resiliency requirements for a system as where did you want to minimize the risk so that you would apply these controls to your sensitive data, but you wouldn't worry about it as much in something else. But at the same time, if people just thought it was like, oh, I just have to put it in the risk register. And it's like, no, 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 we've overloaded the term. And also, you know, RMF usually done by the government with support from contractors. They have to give them all the information of how their, their security items have been 
been implemented. But to keep things safe, you probably need to classify the information in different categories. Timeliness is one of them. So is the information that you're about to depart into the ether going to be not relevant in half an hour? That's something that you need to take into consideration. Uh, or is it something that can give somebody a competitive advantage or something that you don't want out in the ether? So you have to safeguard the things that you want to safeguard at a higher level need to be treated a little bit differently. It's kind of what RMF does. Yes, I agree with that. The system security engineering working group, our focus was that system security is the responsibility of the systems engineer, right? The buck stops here and the system engineer needs to consider it. They can't just say, I don't have to worry about it. I'll bring in that security expert later. And especially in cyber physical systems, the last thing you want is somebody who knows how to secure a computer coming in to determine what your requirements are for your SCADA system. And, you know, the early days of cyber physical systems, the security philosophy was, well, SCADA is so complicated, you would have to know what you were doing to be able to hack into it so it's safe. A good example of that is the MUOS waveform was being developed. I think I was in Anaheim and I was sitting right next to the NSA representative. It was a PDR or something. And we were talking during a break and we were talking about MUOS and he goes, yeah, MUOS hasn't even come to us yet. Mm -hmm. They've been developing it for years and they haven't even thought about putting the security infrastructure into the basic design. Huge mistake. And this is exactly what you're saying. Thank you for bringing So are you looking for us to complete the questionnaire? I just followed the link. So for Friday, I'm sharing out a little bit about the conversation, what we're having now. Clearly, MUOS is one of the examples. I worked at the National Security Agency and was um, part of a team working on um, those on, on those programs. One of the things that I'm looking at on Friday is really having this conversation about we have a disruptive period right now, which is control systems, industrial control systems are at an intersection with our IT from a Purdue model from the top down. When we talk about doing security scanning or HPSS, we're at the higher levels of the Purdue model. And really to get to the continuous monitoring, we need to get down into the lower levels of the control system. So we're at this intersection. And I think that the INCOSE systems engineering, it's really a systems engineering challenge and the INCOSE community is one to help to navigate what that intersection looks like and through the manual mm -hmm. to be able to help provide guidance. So that's what Friday is about. In the link in chat, yes, I did ridiculously put in, yes, please help because that the data points that we're gathering are robust as we're able to get inputs. Um, and someone asked in the chat if that may be shared. Yes, the questionnaire does identify what sector and what area an individual identifies, whether it's IT, OT, both, and what sectors. So it can be broadly shared because we do have those questions up front. I will say it's a lot of questions hang in there for about 18 to 20 minutes. <laughs> but I wish I had arranged it in a more arbitrary way rather than progression because it's very IT up front and OT. But I think that'll give us more data points to understand what's happening on our canvas. I think in the environment, expecting control system operators who are very domain knowledgeable to become IT, CISSP type individuals and get different training and then be that expert, maybe it's not the right answer. Perhaps it's more of an INCOSE guidance that starts to really hone in on that intersection between those two, the control system world and the IT world because they do approach things from a different perspective. And I think it's a systems engineering approach that's going to help us navigate through this disruptive period. I teach two classes on cybersecurity. One is cybersecurity case study. That class actually starts tomorrow, so I'm quite familiar with the case studies. Uh, of the nine case studies, four of them are cyber physical systems. So I start with Maruki because that's the earliest one I do. That was an insider threat, and it's a SCADA system where the disgruntled employee disrupted the SCADA system and it dumped sewage all over the area of Australia. So it's a pretty disgusting, but it's a good case study. And he was arrested for it. So there's a lot of public domain knowledge about it. I, of course, Natanz, I do the, the Stucknet. And then I do uh, the energy firms. It's a supply chain piece where the dragonfly. And then I do DIN as my denial of service, which is an IoT device. And then my last case study is the Ukraine power grid. And so I do both of those. So I try to get that so the students are looking at 
supply chain. They're looking at the SCADA systems. They're looking at denial of service on the IT side, and they're looking at the supply chain threats on the OT side and you know the insider threat as well. And then the other one I do is about cybersecurity and cyber resiliency requirements development. And that one, I have a case study that I make up. You know, the commercial in the U.S. on the Property Brothers and their ADT, it's like the ring doorbell and they have the security you can run from your phone. So that's our case study. Every week we're applying the concepts to that particular example. And then one week I say, oh no, we got to add a control to shut off the water. And so I get that cyber physical piece in there as well, plus controlling the thermostat. No, I just resonated. You know, I'm doing this connection with this conversation and circling back to needs and developing a system. Some needs aren't obvious. Your customer Mm -hmm. has a need to brew hot coffee, right? Mm -hmm. And how do they realize that their coffee maker could be infiltrated with all of its software by denial of service opportunities? And, And so the makers of these products, they think about that first need, but are they always, you know, realizing these, these additional environmental and constraint needs that might need to be addressed that are situational and emerging, right? This is a growing field. I like the fact that we are going to want to get people more focused on their other stakeholders and their other needs, not just the obvious ones. And Tammy, that's one reason why when I was covering the definition of validation yesterday, it was something that came out of either 15288 or System Engineering Handbook, but that added phrase, it's not just validating the system can meet its intended purpose in the operational environment by intended users, but also that unintended users cannot deny the ability of the system to meet its intended purpose. That last phrase, I think, really brings in the need for system engineers to understand, even though some of the stakeholders may not have explicitly stated a need for cybersecurity or resiliency, that it's the engineer's responsibility to address those negative threats to the successful operation of the system. Yes, I like where you're going with that, Lou, and I'm very excited, and Tammy and Beth, with the courses that you're teaching, is that we feel as as engineers that sin of omission of knowing when there is something that is a risk, whether it's a stated need or requirement or not. And some of the cases that Beth brings up, for example, uh, we have a very fragile ecosystem, our sectors are very dependent on one another. So as Tammy identified, I look at them as highly dynamic classes, depending on what the sector is and depending on the dynamic state of the class really depends on what the use is. So as systems engineers and looking at the intersection of these control systems in our fragile environment, when we look at hospitals, a hospital without water can go one, two, three days. But when you start talking about 14 days, then you start losing your patients. So it's a very fragile system. We build our FEMA risk on, I live here on the East Coast, neatly tucked away on the Atlantic Coast where we have weather events. And we train and we plan for weather events and as systems engineers, really looking into those highly dynamic classes and how to look towards in Coast Day guides to not only design systems, for if there's a weather event to ensure that we still have the water supply that we need and clean water, but also to ensure that we have the water supply and clean water in other given contextual. So it's highly contextual and highly dynamic environments. And that's really where this INCOSE would be incredibly valuable as we start looking across these sectors. And it's very much, it's a sin of omission if we as systems engineers are not ensuring that the systems are performing the mission as required by the need, regardless of whatever the dynamic state of the system is in. I teach my students that they have to have use cases and misuse cases. And the misuse cases include a malicious intent, like a cyber actor, but also the disaster that you talked about. In defense systems, I have the battle short use cases. The idea that we have this use case of how the operator is going to work the system. Well, what happens if something's on fire? What happens if the radar is overheating, but they're in a battle? You don't want the radar to, to shut down to protect itself. You know, it gets into survivability. It ends up being this use case scenario for adverse conditions. The weather is interesting. I was involved in developing business continuity plans for our program. You know, it was hypothetical. We did the desktop stuff and we did it because we had to. And we were very fortunate that we did because we ended up having a disaster, not one we thought we would have. We had a helicopter that was lifting a piece of equipment crash and took out a side of the building. So it was an accident, but the business continuity plan 
can kick into effect from that. You know, I've tied this down to my own career and working on spacecraft for many years. It was just a thing you did. You knew your environments, you captured your environments, you looked at your environments because spacecraft live in a very inhospitable place and you can't go necessarily up and, and maintain them. And so for years, it was this approach that we would always, as part of our development work, not just capture our performance and functional requirements, not just capture perhaps some, some specialty requirements, but also the environments and the best ways to capture those and levy them as part of your requirement suite has been a fairly challenging thing for a lot of the requirements team to do because they can be dynamic. They can be difficult to figure out what they are. Some are known, some evolve. It's almost like a moving target. So I, I resonate with the, you know, operate in the dynamic state of environment. Yeah, that's what spacecraft teams have to do all the time is assess that. It just now comes full circle to how that would work for other applications as well and, and different ways we can approach it. I like relating it to the space and now we're bringing that in closer to home in that our transportation or agricultural, even our food supply, our food security and the type of agricultural engineering and systems engineering, they are all highly interdependent and that's that systems engineering piece. So the same way that one would approach systems for our space station or systems that are now for Mars and any type of spacecraft, it's taking that systems engineering that Encosi is so strong at in that space type of environment but now it's how do you put it out into in our environments here that are you know closer to home and more so as Beth pointed out with the case studies that she provides to the students is that now it's something that it's really in all of our sectors and perhaps that push I'd like to be able to see where you know we can really drive that home much heavier through the ANCOSI guidance is as we're designing a system, if we're doing a business enterprise resource planning system, it's like, oh, what control systems do you touch? And Have you interfaced with Rick Dove and his Agile working group? I am um, a newbie here to all these working okay. groups, so I'm going to make that uh, note. Rick has the system security working group. He also has the Agile SE working group. Which working yeah. group are you talking about? He does both. The Agile working group, you don't want to misinterpret the use of the word Agile there. They treat Agile as a development method. Also, a big focus is on developing Agile. Agile systems. So agile systems engineering is not as much of a process as it is as developing an agile system that can take into account unexpected things during operations. And, and even though you didn't plan for something, you built your system agile enough so that you can still get the mission done, even if the bad things happen, no matter what they are. They have some really good papers about what an agile system is. It's closely related to resilience and robustness, but he defines agile systems slightly differently different than those. I think you'd benefit from reaching out to him as well. He's also done some webinars. If you look at the webinar library for Rick Dove, he has Agile SE 101, 102. He's got a number of webinars on it. Yeah, that's very useful. I will reach out to him. I like that. Um, we're working with INL on Resilience Week and having um, a workforce a group in Resilience Week this year, as well as a more situational awareness for industrial control systems or mosaics capability demonstration that we are using an Agile approach, a very similar Similarly, agile and resiliency, it has different meanings than looking at a risk, what happens if, as much as are you managing your system with resiliency, which would be that intersection. So I will reach out to Rick Dove. Thank you very much for introducing me into the group. Thank you. A great paper that was put out by Don Firesmith out of the CMMI, Software Engineering Institute. He put out a series of really good blogs on resiliency. There's like three or four different blogs on that. He goes into a lot of detail on a resilient system. I think everyone could probably benefit from that. And depending on the kind of system that they're developing is to address that concept. Yeah. And Friday, the system System Security Engineering Working Group has a workshop on trying to harmonize all the system security engineering terms. Uh, usually I run away from a session on definitions and taxonomy, but we're finding that the IT side of security has their terms and what they mean. And then you have the DOD and defense systems and program protection and their terms. And then we have what we talk about with systems engineering. So when we talk about cybersecurity, it should be the same for all of them. And when we talk about cyber resiliency, it should be the same for all of them. And so one of the things we've done to prepare for that is gather up all the different terms to make sure that it applies to a control system 
systems to, you know, Internet of Things to space systems to medical devices. Because we're finding that people are talking past each other with what they think the terms mean. So interesting that you bring that up. I had just today an email exchange with Daryl Hagley regarding DOD's approach. He's DOD cybersecurity. And he actually has a comment regarding a disconnect. And I'll just, I don't mind sharing it with you. I'll read it. So his comment today was pretty much saying that there's a disconnect with reports signed to the president by the secretaries of defense and homeland security, energy and transportation. And he'd like to see integration of the language. Specifically, he says that in DOD, we say control systems we and should drop the industrial and that labeling industrial prevents the affiliation among system owners and operators with how they're looking at solutions for facilities or logistics. Two ends of the Q-tip because DOD is very small compared to what the industry is saying. So that goes back to what you're saying, Beth, on what are the terms in, in COSE and the broader commercial community, we're saying industrial control systems or industrial systems. In DOD, we see where DOD, DHS is really wanting to focus on control systems, which nuances, words matter, but we're just not at that space where we're talking the same language yet. Words over. matter. I love that because I think Lou and I have had several conversations about the manual and the way we're talking about certain terms and using certain terms, and they trigger some people based on their experiences and backgrounds versus others, like me and my my vast displeasure of the word verification requirement. It triggers me, but other people totally get it, understand it, know how to do it. So uh, synthesizing at least some common foundations at least will help, but you'll still always have the outliers. Lou had actually sent me a note, and uh, this is a really good opportunity because we have 30 minutes of this time left. If anyone wants to stay on to the end here, we have some experts, if you will. I, I like I like to use the word expert when I talk about Lou in particular, uh, but there are definitely some experts in requirement working group. And we like to try every now and then to do the ask the experts. So for those of you who work in the field or study the field and you've been challenged, with developing needs, developing requirements, verifying them, validating them. If you have any particular challenges, this is an awesome forum right now because we have people with many, many years of experiences across different areas. I think this is a really good chance to turn this now to and ask the experts if anyone wants to dive in a little bit on how to do something. Or any issues they're having that they would like advice on. There's 21 people on here with this hundreds of years of experience. Most likely any issue you're having is not unique. So Someone may else have seen it. So feel free to bring up any topic. One of my pet peeves, I had it when I was in industry, and then I continue to have it when I'm teaching, is the perception that contractors have that validation is done by the customer. So when I start to talk about validation, they say, we don't do validation, the customer does that. How do I combat that? I was like, didn't that hit what Ron was saying earlier about how at the engineering levels, we tend to always focus on the requirements, the very tactical thing. Mm -hmm. And oh, those business people... <laughs> Right. There's a paper that Jim Armstrong wrote about validation. He brought up several different topics, and that was exactly one of the issues that he brought up was that the, the customer thing. And the one of the things is has got to be reputation of both the supplier and the customer. So if you have a system that you say, well, I'm not responsible for validation, and you deliver it and it fails, that could hurt your reputation because you would think that you want to do more than just the letter of the requirement, that you're really truly interested in the success of your customer. In my view, I'm always going to ask the customer, even if they don't address certain things, because there is implicit requirements and explicit. We usually have the explicit and they write those down, but there's an implicit expectation that may not have been communicated because they expect professionals to take care of those things anyway. And that's true of a lot of the quality kind of things, the illities. There's a lot of implicit expectations without explicitly stating it. And in the manual, I warn people about that. I warn people when they're working with the different stakeholders to understand understand they're both implicit and explicit. On your specific question, Jim's paper is on the website under, I think, the guide for verification validation. There's a folder about contributors' inputs. And if you look at Jim Armstrong's paper on validation, you'll see that because several years ago, he had observed that validation was kind of an afterthought to a lot of engineers. And he thought that was a really big issue. And that's one of the drivers why we're emphasizing needs and understanding those 
those needs so that system validation is what makes the customer happy. So we shouldn't ignore that question. You can find that paper. If you can't send me an email, I'll find a copy of it for you. Well, I could put okay. a link in here too. Lou, remind me, which folder was it in? From memory, I think there's a folder under the guide for V&V &V on contributors' inputs, papers, and whatever. And inside that, there's papers by several contributors. And Jim Armstrong has two or three papers that are in that folder. All right. If I find it, I'll put it in the chat, the link. If not, I've got a copy of it. We can put it in there. In my world, I call validation buy-in. We have Tim's with our customer as often as we think we need to have them. Once every two weeks, usually, we have review meetings that they're invited to. When we do the system requirements, we make sure they sign them off because the system requirements are what our understanding of how we're going to meet their what's, right? So if they give us a PRD, a performance requirements document, we take that, we come up with a system requirements document. If they buy into that, that's what gets sold off usually is the system spec. By not understanding requirements from the performance sector or the problem domain leads to a lot of assumptions that have a lot of risks. The more communication or validation that you have with your customer, the more you can clarify those things, get them documented because that's important and you can reduce your assumptions and reduce your risks and be able to get your system developed a lot quicker. So I found a paper that's called uh, Continued Evolution of Validation Issues and Answers. Jim Armstrong from 2007 IS. That's most likely it, yes. Okay, thanks. And in the second half of the paper, he has a, a section headed based on just what you said. It's the customer's role, not mine. I have an intriguing uh, question which is coming to my desk in this last two, three years. Due to the increase of digitalization uh, products, the usual question, how many parts, how many pieces, etc., cannot be answered easily by power sample sizes and so on, simply because we can have millions, billions of items with uh, digitalization. So every sample I can indicate is simply overcome by the, by the possibilities to generate samples in digi the digitalization world. So I'm moving from the determining the quantity of samples to be put under, under test independently what is the test, obviously, to the representativeness of the, the samples we, have put, we put under test. Does this make sense? Or, uh, uh, and uh, is this a common, this common situation? If you're talking about system verification, you know, that's one thing. If you're talking about production verification, that's another. I think you're talking about system verification and size. Yes, system verification. And so you're saying there's, there's a lot of things out there that you can't do at the system verification. So what you do is you have verification at lower modules of the requirements. And then they all link up into your major verification plan so that you can ensure that everything got covered. If the requirements are aren't well formed, you won't be able to do that. So you have to make sure you form your requirements uh, so that they can be easily verified. May not be easily met, but the criteria for whether or not it passes or fails has to be very clear and concise and, and easy to discern. Does that help? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Bruce, you're awfully quiet. You're normally uh, quite a good participant in all of our cafes. Just finding this discussion interesting. I think I burnt myself out in the previous session. Got it. No, it's okay to lurk too. No, not a problem. I'm just normally used to seeing you uh, very actively engaged in our discussion. So I wanted to give you a chance to weigh in on your as, thoughts. As a process of building a, a decision management tool and am semi-retired, I'm a little less directly involved in commercial activities that I've been. So I can bring up some historical things that I've been through, but not a lot that I'm currently doing in this area, other than building a requirements tool. When you have that, I might have a customer for you. <laughs> I'm actually getting ready to release it in beta on a demo site, but it's primarily a decision focused tool using decisions as a knowledge management capture technique between requirements and other systems engineering entities. It has a slightly different focus, although the tool is probably just about doors in 2001 right now with the decision management tool they had built into it for a while. I'm actually working with the person that worked with Motorola on that tool, that Motorola Labs actually developed the tool and added it into doors with the QSS. So so trying to catch back up to this century. I always wanted to have a, a, a systems engineering tool that would I could get to do what I wanted it to do. So I'm going to open source this and everybody will be able to do that. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Hey, Bruce, you mentioned that you could just contribute historical. When I hear the word historical, I hear lessons learned. I'm not suggesting that I'm missing anything by that. Just that when, when the discussion is specifically about what's happening at a company right now, I, I really don't have a pulse of that. So I get nervous when I hear the word historical. I think somebody has a hysterical 
perspective, not necessarily his, it may not be uh, relevant. I've been, I've been accused of that also. Just to uh, clarify that, I, what I mean is that if somebody comes in and they want to contribute their historical perspective and they're doing it in such a way as to say, we tried that before and it didn't work, don't try it again. That's what I call a hysterical. Is somebody bringing contact and the reason it was done this way was for this, that kind of got lost in translation. That's helpful. It's it's content. Just today, someone in uh, Teams chat, in internal Teams chat, uh, wrote uh, historical best practices instead of historical, but that was clearly the uh, right uh, things you wanted to write. I've been uh, silent here and listening in, and uh, I really like uh, all these discussions. And uh, going down the memory lane, I just reflected, uh, talked to uh, the industry guys here uh, back home in Sweden uh, during this week, and I was kind of praying near in the requirement area and uh, as I noted uh, I bought the first uh, doors license in, in Europe and uh, worked with uh, Richard Stevens and all that way back then and um, that was kind of developing an evolutionary time and I thought wrongly that we had solved all this with requirements that we knew what that was and that we did the right way and I now have learned that we do not do it today uh, the right way I, I mean the experts do but I mean most people don't really know exactly what this is and when we're talking about this cementology about what needs and requirements are, it shows us that we have a way to go. And the other thing is that things changed in the beginning and for decades we only had the doors. There were systems before that, of course, yes, but afterwards we now have the MBSC and, and all those things. And we also have the cyberphysical and we have uh, a complexity that has uh, changed and evolved. And that also, we have the mission threads and, and whatever, system systems. So requirements are another thing today. So I, I really like the discussion we have here because in one way it is the same thing as it was in the beginning, but in practice it is not. We have to have a foundation on what this really is and how to regard as a reference that we can lean on as a standard type of thing. And then we have to understand that that much so we can tailor it. If you, if you don't understand the topic as much as you can tailor it, then you cannot make use of the standard either. That's why the E15-288 is such a great thing, because it's rather thin. Uh, and Richard Stevens, by the way, who, who did the doors, he did the uh, standards for the European Space Agency and all that. And, and it was a beauty to read that. It was a very thin paper, but it was only core uh, knowledge in it. And that is what this group do doing. And this is very, very important. And I really like all these discussions. And I hope to... Uh, read and see if I can come with some comments on uh, these papers. That would be great. We can really use your input. So actually, I'm not really sure. Uh, the complexity has surely changed some with the addition of computers into the system, but I think it's more our understanding that we have control over it that's really changed. Because you take a look at the tools that were available back in the late 90s, and take a look at something like RDD 100, and it was basically a full-blown system tool that when it went out of business, SciTech picked up that business space. So again, the tools go back a pretty long long way at this point in time into the same, at least the same decade that Incozi was formed. One of the things that I, I fully agree with you, Ingar, is, is that smaller organizations have a lot of trouble working with the tool set and the intellectual content of what's available at Incozi. And I think there's a lot of companies that have impact in human endeavors that aren't large enough to address a lot of the knowledge that already exists in systems engineering. So one of the things that I expect needs to be done is to actually tailor the tools and the specifications to a level at which smaller groups can get their arms around it and start applying. Yes, but on the other way, it's like the, the lawyers, for instance. Uh, in companies, you have lawyers because your core business is something else, but you need to have the legal aspect of it. So you have maybe some indoors, but you uh, use them as consultants. And nowadays you have consultants, you have experts in uh, systems engineering and several aspects of that. And companies, uh, small and large, have to make use of those. You, you have to understand the value of systems engineering. And closely, we have put all these work while you all know all those things. So so there's a mission to do it, and I think we know what that is, so we have to educate it. And to make this all work, you have to take one piece at a time. And if you just make the requirement management as one thing, then you have configuration management, you have all those things you have to pile up together to make systems engineering.
Therefore, it's so important that we have standards, we have ways of treating each of these areas so they can build a block that works to do not fall to fall apart. I see that now, and I follow this for decades, and I really like how it still grows. So, um, yeah, okay, I agree. But there's also a separation of the idea between systems engineering and systems thinking and who are systems engineers and who have to apply systems thinking. That's another aspect that gets missed in organizations. And I'm not really sure how Incozy as an organization views that separation. I agree there also. And, and just one thought I have there is to be a system thinker, that is something you evolve in and you do not really know it until uh, uh, some time after you have been it. And you cannot educate yourself till it. It's something that appears to be when you have all those things done in the past. If you're a systems engineer, th that's a proficient, th that when you do a task, th then you perform something. But to be a system thinker, th that's more kind of guru. Uh, for instance, whatever I see, I see a system. I think system and I do uh, recollections of things I see and think about it. And that do not come by education or uh, degrees and all that. It comes by mileage. So the way I look at it is everything you do is mm -hmm. an application of systems engineering. When you go to the grocery store, what do you do? You make a list. What's that list? Your requirements. You ask your wife. She's validating that you got the right stuff on the list. And for me, it's huge risk management because whenever I go in a grocery store, it's a huge fail. So I have to get everything validated with the wife before I actually walk out the door. And even then, there's still issues. Rick, I think that PMI would disagree with you that having a list is a systems engineering thing. I don't see how. A list is a set of requirements. Well, but the PMI would say that a list is a sequence of things that you need to do also. A set of things that you need to gather to be able to perform an operation. That would be me putting my coat on, getting in the car, driving to the grocery store. That, to me, would be more of a procedural thing. But a list of items is a list of requirements that need to be satisfied. Anyway, I don't want to argue that point. I'm just saying that systems thinking is like if you were to buy a house and first say you're a first time uh, homeowner you're going to probably end up with a home that doesn't meet three quarters of your real requirements because you never took the time to think about what you need so now that you're in a house you know what you like and what you don't like proximity of certain rooms for noise and convenience if you're getting older you want a one floor living space if you're younger you want two floors you want laundry upstairs so all those things come into play those are requirements that you're applying applying toward your home. And a systems thinking is putting those all together and prioritizing and see if there's any that you can compromise, which is why it's taking me so long to find a new house because I'm not willing to compromise any of the points. I'm just trying to say that systems thinking is a way to understand the problem holistically. Think of every little thing you can, but don't let it paralyze you. Mm -hmm. Paralysis by analysis. That's mm -hmm. why I'm saying we, we got to get a set of the guides out so we can get feedback on them to the general public and see how we can improve them at that point. I have a time check. There are a couple of really good questions that Loan asked on chat that we could bring up. His first one is, I wonder why we only focus on writing the system requirements as input to design. System requirements have indeed all to be taken into account by design and design is first to work on. But in your companies, don't you also have system requirements impacting other technical processes like integration? Uh, calling the system requirements helps us to have the whole view you know, of life cycle in mind. Approach taken in the manual before the needs comes life cycle concepts. And in some organizations, they want to just develop a concept for operations. But in the manual, we'll talk about life cycle concepts as plural. Any life cycle that the system of interest is going to be touched or is going to be touched by, concepts for those are expected to be developed. They could be enabling systems, and I have requirements on that. I have a concept for integration. And so how am I going to do system integration? What's my concept for verification, validation, concepts for design? So you can have life cycle concepts developed for every life cycle, but they can all be developed in the same place. Even your concept for design early is required because you have to identify critical technologies that are needed to get the expected performance. So I have to assess whether or not those technologies are mature enough to consider for this product. So one of the big focuses is not just operations, but all the life cycles so that they're reflected in the right places. And some of those may be requirements on the system of interest so that it enables integration. Uh, like an automobile industry, there's a, a concept of design for assembly. And so coming up with that concept helps with assembly. The same can be true of integration verification. I need access to data points that may not be needed during normal operations, but I need it for 
to get the data I need for system verification. That's why we have to address all those concepts before we write the needs and transform those into requirements. And so we're doing a lot of concurrent activities all at the same time to make sure that from a systems thinking standpoint, we've covered the whole thing. Does that address your question or anyone else have a comment on that? Very interesting, thank you. Uh, this is John, well said, Lou. Yeah, during the concept stage is when we develop the concepts that you listed there. And there are many, many concepts, of, including the concept of disposal. This is when we do that uh, conceptual engineering, the concept of operations and where the Nkosi handbook mixes up the operations concepts and concept of operations the two documents. But anyway, well taken. It's during the concept stage. Another point I want to mention that is not well communicated in the 1528 or in the handbook, I, I did put it in the section eight of the handbook where tailoring discussion, all processes apply to all stages. It's a matter of degree of how much they apply and none of them are ever zero. In other words, the validation process that Beth brought up, the problem with inquirers and suppliers is who's responsible for validation. They both are. Oftentimes the problem is the acquirer writes the system spec, throws it over the wall to the the contractor and says, go develop the system. And the contractor was not involved in the system spec. So numerous problems develop. The contractor and the, the acquirer both need to validate that the system user needs the mission and business analysis process in 1528 results in valid user needs. Okay, the validation process must be applied during the concept stage to validate that the user need is valid and that the process to express the business emission analysis in terms of user needs and requirements is valid. The process is valid. The validation process is universal to all the stages of the life cycle, not just the tail end of the delivery stage. Okay, this often misunderstood that validation is the kind of the end of the project and that's the customer's responsibility. That's not true. Secondly, verification and validation process must be applied at every level of the system hierarchy. In other words, you know, the system allocates requirements and user needs down to the subsystems. Let's use the term or elements. That process needs to be validated and the requirements verified at that level and down to lower and lower levels. It's at all levels of their life cycle. That's called recursion. The processes are applied up and down the system hierarchy concurrently and all processes apply to all stages and all levels of the hierarchy uh, and so forth. So those concepts are not well communicated in the 1528 in the handbook, but they're in there. I agree, John. And hopefully when you read through the manual, you'll see that those concepts are repeated multiple times. Great, good. I wish we could get them into the handbook, into the 1528, so that people understand. A lot of system engineers just read the standards as a sequential process. Oh, we do this first, do that second, because that's the way they're documented in the handbooks and the standards, in the paragraphs of, this, of the document. Document. That's a great misconception. All processes apply to all stages all the time, and it's not well communicated. I think that's a good reason for the manual and that as authors to the sections of the handbook, you know, you were given a page count. Everyone has to stay within that page count. There's a lot of things that need to be communicated that there just isn't the page count for it. There's a lot of kind of how do I actually implement that kind of information we don't have the page count for. So the manual is that missing manual that provides hopefully that extra information you want from the perspective of the needs and requirements of that common thread that tie all the processes together. One last question that was asked by Loat, he says, someone continues the traceability requirements and other processes, virtues of the system. For example, when working on a mechanical component, we may specify the design to a manufacturer with a kind of design requirements for which they are awaiting compliance proofs. From a terminology standpoint, so we don't mix up what we mean in the context of requirements. In the manual and our documents make a distinction that system input requirements are input in the design process and then design output specifications are what's given to the manufacturers. From a traceability standpoint, we advocate that you have traceability across the whole life cycle. All artifacts across all life cycles are traced. And that's part of the integrated data as a foundation of system engineering, which I think is the real intent of MBST, is that we have an integrated data set and all the artifacts are part of that and they're linked together. So you have a consistency in terminology, you have a consistency in what's being communicated. And then from a change management standpoint, all the things that are linked together across the life cycle, if I change a 
need statement, that's going to have impact on requirements. That's going to have an impact on the validation stuff for the needs. It's going to have an impact on the verification of the system meeting the requirements. It's going to have an impact on the design. The other thing I'm not sure about how you'd maintain that traceability, once the design output specs are given to the manufacturers, how do you prove that the system was built to those specs? And usually that's under a quality organization, but they're going to have some kind of traceability that from a quality standpoint, that they can show that the system was built or coded to whatever the design output specs were. And I think we're out of time. Hey, I really appreciate that, Lou. And this was an excellent uh, example of our exchange cafes that we are going to be promoting as well throughout the year. So this idea of the RWG continuing the conversation among our community is something we like to maintain, not just at IW. So what we're going to be doing is uh, I put a link again to where I'm posting charts and recordings. If you navigate around that page, you'll find our main requirement page as well. And we have a general meeting section, and that's where we'll post the continual discussions and meetings we'll do throughout the year. So you can even go look at past recordings. I want to thank everybody for their great participation. I want to encourage you all to join the requirement working group if you've not already joined in your cozy profile under committees. I will be sending out emails through that distribution to set up February discussions and March discussions. And we're going to exchange perhaps speakers with cafes. Cafes are like what we did this last hour and a half. I will be putting out information regarding our material and our products, further review opportunities, further input requests. And then as we get closer to publishing, we are going to set up some webinars for the broad and cozy community to describe the manual and the various guides with the whole and cozy crowd, not just the requirements working group. I really, again, want to thank you. It's time to close out the meeting and let you all go. I hope you all enjoy IW. I hope for those of you that are signed up, you get everything you, you hope to get out of these discussions throughout the next several days. Any last minute thoughts, comments before we say goodbye? Just thank you, Tammy, for doing a wonderful job organizing this and running the RWG. Thank, thank you. Second that. Really that. appreciate yeah. it. And I'm glad I found you. Oh, I'm glad you found us too. Okay, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and stop okay. the recording and we'll, we'll be talking with you guys again soon.